Today we've got the wise man's fear and I, as you can see I haven't read the entire book but this is like 200 pages the entire book is like a thousand pages long and I have to kind of return it to the library because they're doing an inventory check by like next week so before that happens I'm gonna do a little bit of a a analysis on some of the lines that I really really liked so I picked out two passages from the book one passage is just a normal scene where Kavath is just moving around at the end and then he looks at his sword and the other one is the prologue and so this is the prologue and just random scene analysis I guess and I'm gonna read the scene out loud and you guys are gonna listen and you guys are thinking, okay that's cool or okay that isn't cool and then I'm going to and analyze bits and pieces of the writing to see what makes it so good or impactful and basically that's what I'm gonna do and there isn't very much spoilers I mean I'm just reading the prologue and a bit of chapter one so if you're not okay with even that then goodbye but if you're okay with that and you've and you've already read um, Name of the Wind which is the first book of the series then well I think I guess you're fine with it or if you're just fine with spoilers I don't care let's get right into it this is the prologue a silence of three parts so I'm gonna read it out loud uh, how am I gonna do this so let's just turn the chair a bit and uh, yeah let's let's do this dawn was coming the Waystone Inn lay in silence, and it was a silence of three parts. The most obvious part was a vast, echoing quiet made by things that were lacking. If there had been a storm, raindrops would have tapped and pattered against the sealess vines behind the inn. Thunder would have muttered and rumbled and chased the silence down the road like fallen autumn leaves. If there had been travelers stirring in their rooms, they would have stretched and grumbled the silence away like fraying half-forgotten dreams. If there had been music, but no, of course there was no music. In fact, there were none of these things, and so the silence remained. Inside the waystone, a dark-haired man eased the back door closed behind himself. Moving through the perfect dark, he crept through the kitchen across the tap room, and down the basement stairs. With the ease of long experience, he avoided loose boards that might make groan or sigh beneath his weight. Each slow step made only the barest tap against the floor. In doing this, he added a small, furtive silence to the larger echoing one. They made an analam of sorts, a counterpoint. The third silence was not an easy thing to notice. If you listen long enough, you might begin to feel it in the chill of the window glass and the smooth plaster walls of the innkeeper's room. It was in the dark chest that lay at the foot of a hard and narrow bed, and it was in the hands of the man who lay there, motionless, wait watching for the first pale hint of dawn's coming light. The man had true red hair, red as flame. His eyes were dark and distant and he lay with the resigned air of one who has long ago abandoned any hope of sleep. The waystone was his, just as the third silence was his. This was appropriate, as it was the greatest silence of the three, holding the others inside itself. It was deep and wide as autumn's ending. It was heavy as a great river smooth stone. It was the patient, cut flower sound of a man who was waiting to... So that was the prologue, and as you can see, it's super duper immersive and very, very descriptive and really pulls you into the story. And I'm going to analyze par paragraph by paragraph what makes it so special. So the per first paragraph is about, oh, the waystone inn lay in silence, and it was a silence of three parts, just one line. So nothing special there, but what really it does, it sets up for the next four paragraphs and what it's going to be. So it obviously kind of organizes everything and okay, so we're gonna we're gonna think about these three parts of silence and that's what these next three paragraphs is probably gonna describe and it kind of sets it up. So the first one is honestly my favorite part of the entire entire um, entire prologue. Of course, uh, I really like the last part as well, which I'm gonna explain later, but this first part is really, really well done. So the most obvious part is the vast echoing quiet. Okay. That's kind of normal writer level, you know, something I would do, like, oh, um, the room was quiet. It was so quiet that you could hear yourself breathe. You could feel your heartbeat. 
it felt like that if you broke this silence, the silence was, if you broke this silence, something bad would happen, or the silence was as silent as a, as a dagger of an assassin in the dead of the night, you know, it's just silence. But then, the, this author goes on to say, um, vast echoing quiet made by things that were lacking. And it goes on to have a lot of really descriptive lines about a storm, thunder, travelers, and then music. Now, a couple things. First of all, what this author is trying to do is creating contrast with the silence using bigger things. For example, uh, thinking about colors, if there was black next to white, then obviously the black and white would look a lot clearer because they're opposite colors. It's the same thing. Here, what they're trying to do, what he, well, not trying to do, what they did was they got a silence. They're trying to describe a really dead silence. And in order to do that, they describe a storm, which is super duper loud thunder which is also super duper loud and the quiet sounds of travelers stirring in their rooms and this creates contrast to the silence that they are trying to describe okay thunder is super duper loud storm is super duper loud and travelers slowly stirring in their rooms make a noise and music well not music but these things make a huge sound but these things aren't there and the silence reigns supreme. That is what the author is doing, and that is just creating contrast to emphasize the science that they're doing. And I feel that is really, 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 really impressive because like I said, any normal person that is sane wouldn't do that in any, in any regard. I, I, I don't usually see that. And as for the music line about if they're happy music, but no, of course there was no music. That is a, actually a direct jab toward Kothe, the main character. Kothe, Kothe, I don't know, man, it's hard to pronounce, but it's a jab to the main character because the main character used to play music, but no longer does for whatever reason, which we hope we'll find out later in the books. There's three books to the series so far. And that, that just, that's just a little reference to Kvothe that the readers can sort of go, ah, yes, I remember, I remember, I see what you're doing, author, author man, I, I remember reading it from last book, you know, I remember music is special to Kvothe, but he, for some reason, he doesn't play it anymore, you know, you know, I know, I know what's going on here, and it's a little jab to the reader, and making sure and reminding them of some, what's going on, which is just masterfully done within this beautiful, 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 beautiful description here. Second paragraph. The second paragraph is about a dark-haired man kind of creeping through this um, room. And this also is kind of a se second level of the first paragraph. Because if you remember correctly, the first paragraph talks about big, loud things from nature and then transitions to a people. But they are, they're not there, right? They are things that are lacking. They are things that are not there. Then the second one is more about a silence that is forced, a silence that is on purpose, purposeful silence. Because if the first one is a silence that is created by things that are not there, so you, that's, not, that's out of your power, right? But this silence is about a guy trying to be silence. So if the first paragraph had kind of shown us, okay, the definition of silence, because you know, it's opposite, it's contrasting to the, uh, to the different sounds that they have mentioned. The second paragraph is about a person trying to keep silent. Like, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you wanna play video games without your parents knowing, that kind of silence. The kind of silence that you keep in secret, the secret silence, the silence that a person tries to make to not awake people in the middle of the night, the silence of a deadly dagger in the night. And that kind of silence is what they're, what she's describing here. It's a human silence and it kind of brings us, it kind of transitions to the third silence. The third silence is about the innkeeper or Kothe as we know. And it's about this innkeeper who is waiting for himself to die. And he's lying down and he can't sleep. He never slept. He, has, he hasn't slept in years. And he's kind of just sitting there, I mean, lying there and just looking at dawn. And I think that this middle paragraph, uh, the second paragraph, no, well, third, second, second descriptive paragraph is like a bridge to the third paragraph. Because the second paragraph is a human, human silence, right? A human trying to be silent. And the first paragraph was 
silence, the definition of silence. So the definition of silence, transitioning to a human silence that they're trying to be silent. And the third silence it about, is about, I think, a, a silence of a dead man or a silence that was taken, you know, like the, the joy and the feeling and the sounds were taken away. And that's the type of silence I think that the third paragraph is talking about. Because you see, there's a lot of different descriptions here, but especially the silent, especially the lines about the resigned air of one who has long ago abandoned any hope of sleep, and that it is as heavy as a great river smooth stone as the patient cut flower sounds of a man who is waiting to die. And these lines are just showing, really showing the silence as if it, it really gives the vibe of, okay, his joy, his sound was taken from him, and his silence is not forceful. He's not trying to be silent, but something inside of him broke. Something inside of him was taken, and now only silence remains. Because silence can also be mentally correlated with empty or, or hollow, and that is what describes the third paragraph. And all in all, the first paragraph, I mean, it's just one line, is, is just setting up for the silence in three parts. First paragraph is about the first silence or the silence, the definition of silence against nature and against different things that don't exist. The second silence is about a person trying to be silent, a person who's trying to be silent in the night and trying not to wake anyone, trying not to make any sound. The third silence is about a person who has something taken from them and now only silence remains. And that is why the entirety of the thing is so impactful. And of course, there's some technical things that uh, one I'm going to mention is this person's sense of rhythm is incredible. For example, uh, here, it, it was deep and wide as autumn's ending. It was heavy as a great river smooth stone. It is the patient cut flower sound of a man who is waiting to die. This entire, these three, these three lines are perfectly written because because the amount of syllables and the amount of words in the first and second sentence I mentioned is pretty much the same, which creates this kind of build-up kind of vibe. It was deep and wide as autumn's ending. It was heavy as a great river smooth stone. It's like listing. And then the final is like the top. It's like the cherry on top. It was the patient cut flower sound of a man who was waiting to die, which is also coincidentally the most important line in the entire prologue. And that rhythm really builds it up there. And some of the descriptions, like for example, the description about the thunder, the description about the storm, has a really unique rhythm to them that really, really immerses you and really draws you into the book, which is, you know, either natural talent or a lot of practice or both. I'm guessing both in this case. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much my analysis of the prologue. Now, the next uh, analysis is rather short. Um, I'm not going to... I'm not gonna really talk much about this one. Um, I'm just gonna do two paragraphs, two really, really short paragraphs, and that, that's the end of it. And this is Kote, or Kote, but he's, he's Kote right now because he's acting to be an innkeeper. And this one is about him kind of just doing innkeeper stuff and then lying, and then he's done suddenly, and then he looks at a sword. So let's get right into it. Okay. And then abruptly, there was nothing left to do. Everything was ready. Everything was clean and orderly. The red-haired man stood behind the bar, his eyes slowly returning from their faraway place, focusing on the here and now, on the inn itself. They came to rest on the sword that hung on the wall above the bottles. It was in a particularly beautiful sword, not ornate or eye-catching. It was menacing in a way the same way a tall cliff is menacing. It is gray and unblemished and cold to the touch. It is sharp as shattered glass. Carved into the black wood of the, morning bo of the mounting board was a single word, folly. Now, I just wanna, I just wanna talk about this line. So, uh, I, what I want to particularly put emphasis on is of course the sword um, description. And the sword description is of course the one that's most emphasized in these two paragraphs. But I really want to talk about this. So it talks about this sword that's that isn't isn't eye catching. It isn't well made or beautiful or or ornate or or jeweled or bejeweled. But they say that a sword is menacing. Okay, uh, quick, uh, run your run your minds back to some of the fantasy books you you've read. Have you ever heard an author? 
describe a sword to be a sword to be menacing. Not sharp, not sharp to the touch, not not cold, not jagged, not straight, not beautiful, or not elegant, but menacing. Of course, there is a description about how sharp it is, but the emphasis I want to put is on a menacing one. It is as menacing the same way a tall cliff is menacing, they say. And I think that really, that word choice is very, very intentional here. Of course, um, of course, the author is probably just writing by instinct and that's what he came up with or he edited it, I'm not sure, you know. I mean, a lot of these descriptions just come to natural writers or natural writers who've done a lot of, done their job for a while. But this description is really, really, genius because no matter if the author intended it or not it has an effect because menacing is something you call something unstoppable right something that is something that is natural for example a a storm is menacing a, a tornado or a hurricane is menacing it's not something you can stop or can do anything about it's it has the it is the definition of fearful menacing powerful and it is not something that you can do anything about, especially like, for example, a tall cliff. What are you supposed to do against a tall cliff? Sure, you're scared of a tall cliff. You're scared of falling over and dying, but what are you going to do about it? Like mow it down or something somehow? Like you can't do anything about a tall cliff being menacing. And that really, that and that, that kind of feeling, that feeling of I can't do anything about it, that unstoppable, immovable force is put onto a sword. And it really, really shows how dangerous and how scary and what this sword. And it really, really shows how scary and how dangerous and how menacing, <laughs> I'm using the word now, the sword is. And it really puts that feeling of fear and the fear and the feeling that you feel from something menacing onto the sword itself. And that really, really just makes the sword so much more special than it, it should be, honestly. And yeah, that's what makes the makes this line so what I found super impressive and why it creates such a good effect. And another thing is the name of the sword is Folly. And I've only read half of Wise Man's Fear and the entirety of the name of the wind, so I'm gonna make a little bit of an assumption. We know, we know that Quothe is a lost man. We know that he failed to we know that Kvothe is a lost man. We know that he has failed. He has failed someone he loved. He has watched someone he loved die. That's something we know. And we know in order to save someone he loved, he had killed kings, merchants, angels even. And I'm guessing that he did that with a weapon, particularly this weapon. This weapon being named Folly. And and also, I uh, I also have a have a little bit of an assumption where later on in this in this book, like in chapter I think chapter two, yeah, chapter two, uh, this kid comes up to uh, this kid that Aaron, by the way, which is coincidentally my name as well. Um, Kwothe is trying to tell him not to go because he is actually Kwothe, and then and then the kid says. But everybody knows Kvothe's sword was made of silver. It wasn't called Folly either. It was Kaysera, the poet killer. And then the innkeeper rocked back a bit and says, the poet killer? Now, okay, he, he doesn't say it's the wrong name. He doesn't seem to be surprised by the fact that the sword's name is Kaysera. But he is surprised by the fact that he thinks that it was Kaisera, the poet killer, because that's the emphasis on what, what Kvothe reacts to. So my guess is that his sword was indeed named Kaisera, perhaps not well, not meaning the word poet killer, but it wasn't Kaisera. However, he he fought and he killed angels and he killed he killed people and mighty kings and lords to save his loved one, but his loved one died and he failed. And it was all a folly. So he named this, he renamed the sword to Folly instead of Kaisera. And that's my guess. Because because it makes sense, right? Because he he's gone through so much death and suffering to save someone only to fail. So what he's left with is nothing really. Just death and suffering and what he's gone through and all the trauma he's gone through. 
So it was all a folly. It was all in vain. So that uh, that so he named his sword, which accompanied him on his sorrowful journey, to folly. And that's my guess. Of course, this is just nothing but an educated guess. But if I'm right, then put a comment down below. And that is pretty much the two paragraphs that I would like to analyze and a little bit of theoretical possibility that I'm mentioning right here. And that is pretty much it. So I will have a full review rating for you guys after I read this entire thing. I still have like, what, like 400 pages of G's. And uh, yep, that is pretty much it for today. Have a great day. And like always, your plot quester, Aaron the Plot Quester. Have a great day. Definitely, definitely recommend the King Killer Chronicles, Wise Event Sphere, and the Name of the Wind if you haven't read that. And yeah, have a great and wonderful day.